Welcome everyone to our monthly international development and innovation seminar. Uh, it's a series of seminars uh, taking place at the Open University. I'm Theo Popeano, I'm Professor of Politics, Innovation and Development at the OU, and uh, I'm really delighted to have uh, this amazing seminar uh, today um, with Liz uh, Anka, who did her PhD here at the OU uh, in DPP, and uh, she's now a uh, communication expert in the broad area of research and development. She also held positions in key Pan-African political and economic institutions, including the African Union and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, and in corporate uh, public relations and mainstream journalism. Now, Liz, um, will draw on her recent book titled Earth, Oceans and Science, Insights from Selected Outstanding Women Scientists, to speak on the issue of power, urgency and legitimacy, reimagining African women in science. Liz will be speaking for about 40 minutes and then uh, her speech will be followed by questions. Uh, we will open the floor to questions and discussion. Now, before um, we start the seminar, just to say that uh, the video is um, being recorded and will be available for playback after. So those people who don't want to be featured uh, can still ask questions uh, via the chat. Just ask to remain anonymous. Uh, you are automatically muted, but please raise your hands if you want to ask uh, a question and please follow us on Twitter. We are on Twitter um, at the International Development uh, at the OU. So um, without uh, further ado, I would like to invite uh, Liz uh, to take the floor for her presentation. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you so much, Theo, and um, for and Craig for welcoming me back home. Um, the Open University was my home for four years, and I am I have nothing but gratitude for for the mentorship and the support that I received there. And I'm so delighted today to be talking about this book. It's the first seminar that I've given since this book was released last year. It is, uh, for me, a labor of love because we started with an idea of uh, a, a, what you call a coffee table book. We thought we would have about, um, I don't know, 25 pages, just photos of a few African women scientists. But as soon as we started working on this book, we started going down the rabbit hole and we ended up with a long list of 100 very good, very outstanding African women who all merited uh, recognition. However, in the end, we chose 25. And instead of the 30 page book that we'd envisioned, we ended with a 200 page book. So it was really just amazing to see this, this wealth of resource that we have, especially because narratives about science in Africa and about African scientists, they they tell this give us a different story. They give us a story of deficiency, of absence. But the reality is that Africa globally is in terms of the percentage of women <clears throat> is slightly ahead. The global average is 28%. Africa has 30% of its scientists as women. Now, this is not about statistics, but it means that the potential of women scientists is not being exploited to its fullest. So this book then sits within a very interesting scenario as the world comes out of the COVID pandemic and then jumps right into emerging conflicts like the Ukrainian war and many other conflicts happening all over the world, including in Africa. So it is a time for us to reimagine our place and our future as a human race. And these narratives of these African women scientists, where we ended up with a book that has such a, a unique title, it is about how 
science impacts on every aspect of our life and how gender is a cross-cutting aspect in that nexus. So that is what this book is about. And we chose to tell these stories in an autobiographical way. So we let the women tell us, we let them use their own words, we let them hear, their, we let them show us their emotions. So we ended up with a book about self-history and self-portrayal and self-analysis. And then a prism through which we can look at how science has evolved in Africa, how it has interrelated with um, <clears throat> issues of history, political and economic developments. And so today, what I want to do is to sort of introduce you to these women and to tell you what they told us. But at the back of our minds, let us keep in mind issues of power, urgency and legitimacy, and what we need to reimagine about the narratives that surround African women in science. So please allow me to start with, uh, with, with a quick definition of um, what of concepts. What do we mean by power? I will use, I know there are many ide ideological and theological concepts of power, but I will use the concepts that I used in my PhD thesis, which was that power is the extent to which a stakeholder can gain access to utilitarian or normative means to impose within a relationship. Now, power connects to legitimacy because it only gains authority through legitimacy, which is a generalized perception or assumption that the actions of a stakeholder are desirable, proper or appropriate with some socially constructed system of norms, values, beliefs and definitions. So how does agency come in? Agency is the salience of power and legitimacy and it depends on the interaction, no, sorry, power and legitimacy depend on the interaction with agency. That is a degree with it, through which a stakeholder can claim that their needs need immediate and urgent attention. So um, when we talk about scientists and power, we are talking, from my perspective at least, uh, we are talking about their ability to acquire normative and utilitarian resources to realize their personal ideology of scientific excellency. And this is dependent on their ability to attain legitimacy within the social worlds that control the necessary resources and also the boundaries and discourses that create those social worlds. So how do we uh, envision how uh, uh, and African women scientists as a social world so we start with the international scientific community that anybody who's gone through the training to become a scientist automatically belongs to this um, concept of an international community scientific community. Now the international scientific community is not homogeneous, it, it's very stratified. And already African scientists within the international scientific community are, are sort of um, they, they, they are a segment and not a very powerful segment of that. Now, African women scientists sit within an already um, uh, weakened social world. They are a sub-social world of African scientists within the international scientific community. So already we begin to see that African women scientists, at least from the narrative point of view, they are not the strongest um, subworld within the international scientific community, at least from a theoretical point of view. So today I want us to reimagine the discourses and narratives surrounding women in, uh, women in science. So we've all had these narratives, science is not for girls, women do not have the aptitude for science and many others. There are also cultural aspects, for example, girls are destined for marriage, um, they should uh, get on with it quite quickly without wasting too much in time in school. And then there are facts and realities about financial issues, infrastructure and development issues, and the status of science in Africa. So um, what I want us to start, to start by doing, as I said, I want to introduce you to these women and I want us to hear from their own words why they became scientists and um, the narratives that they had to contest. 
So these three images, um, this particular image is of a scientist called Habiba Muhammad, who is a Tunisian scientist who works on um, genomics of, of uh, genomics. So um, she told me that she became a scientist because she was she had an inquisitive mind right from the beginning, and she was. She was in a family that sort of welcomed that and nurtured her. Her father was a great advocate of knowledge, culture, and education, which he considered to be the best guarantee for liberty and independence. But she also benefited from being born at a time when post-colonial Tunisia had the reputation of the best, um, the, a premier educator in Africa. So she benefited from that. We have, we have, um, this uh, friend of mine from Algeria, who was inspired to become a geologist by the place she was born in, the, the rocky, the rocky background, um, just she was enchanted from childhood by geology. Um, we have Tabela Nyokong, who grew up in South Africa, where she she said in her own words, uh, she told me. Um, at the age of eight years old, I was sent to live with my grandparents in Lesotho. In the country, sheep rearing has always been a major source of livelihood. And during my childhood, the community relied on children to shepherd their livestock across uh, the network of rivers and mountains. My parents believed in education, and indeed, my desire, their desire was that their children would obtain more education than they had. So my scientific journey started in Lesotho, a scenic land of tall mountains and narrow valleys where I found solace in nature's beauty, learned to appreciate science in nature, to bond with the environment and ask questions about it, to listen to the birds and identify to them, to know which plants are edible, to have an inquisitive mind. So, um, so we still have more women here who have who all have different stories of how they ended up becoming uh, scientists or being inspired at that very young age to become a uh, scientist. Uh, if you allow me, I will just um, quickly read uh, one more for you uh, because it's very important that you hear these uh, words of these scientists. Um, I will read you. Um, this from uh, Maryam Chadid, uh, who told me this. When I was 12 years old, my brother gave me a book that defined the rest of my life. It was a German astronomer, Jonas Kepler, and it was about the laws of planetary motion. Published in the 17th century, the book described the planetary system, its movement around the sun and other physical and astronomical phenomena. From the moment that I read the book, I told my family, my teachers, and indeed anyone who cared to listen that I was going to become an astronomer. This proclamation was met with disbelief because nobody in my community knew anything about astronomy. My family wanted me, their academically gift child, to enter a classical profession like medicine or law. So um, the point here is that young girls, they all have dreams and visions and where they, are, they, they begin to lose power is in terms of how the society about around them reacts to those young dreams and visions. So um, if we move on and look at the story of uh, Segnet Kalemu, somebody I know very, very well, same story, um, from a very young age, awareness of uh, desire to study science uh, and she told me in my village girls were wedded off early through arranged marriages but I was too rebellious too much of a tomboy I questioned the rules too much as such I did not attract any suitors while this must have been distressful for my parents at the time I knew all along that I was lucky these streets were my ticket to freedom to becoming an outstanding student to striking a balance between having a family and a career and to being the leader that I am today. Now, Sayanet's story um, took a very good turn because the entire village, she says, 
the adage that it takes a village to raise a child free applies to me. True, I loved school and was a bright student. I worked hard and I was determined, but I also had immense support around, all around me. My parents instilled in me a great sense of discipline, the value of hard work and integrity. Back then, school was free in Ethiopia and my parents only had to pay for stationery. Once my older brothers had their income, they too invested in my education. I was cheered on by the entire village and I believe that it took a village to raise me. So um, again, that point that talent manifests itself very early, it might come from nature, it might come from a book, but it what happens at that point, those young girls, uh, five to 10 years old, how societies and families respond to, the, to, their, um, to their desire to become scientists or to their inquisitiveness. I have one more story from Jihan Kamel, an Egyptian scientist, whose story was a slightly different. Uh, my interest in sci science started in high school where we had to choose between arts and sciences. Um, and some of the male teachers and professors I encountered told me that women did not belong in science. Women, it was maintained, can study humanities, but not natural sciences of engineering, which should be left for men. In a way, my choice of science was a rebellion against such discourses. The Arab culture and religion and its ideas on the role and praise of women presented a different set of barriers. I knew I would have to work exceptionally hard to gain knowledge and to become as skillful as possible to rise above such biases. Thus, I, I developed a strong determination to excel. So this is a completely different story about how the rebellion that, you know, that women, uh, that shapes women in those early days when they're, they're on their journey to becoming scientists. Now, um, when there is a phase when the career, the scientific career takes a turning point, and this is determined by a number of reasons. For example, for Asta Gebre Christos, um, an, an, uh, an Ethiopian scientist, it was failure actually that uh, determined her journey. She intended to study medicine, but she failed completely when she sat her primary school, uh, her high school exam. She failed completely. She just would, could not go to university. She did not qualify. But um, as the title of this uh, cutting uh, states, destiny intervened because she found herself admitted or offered a, an opportunity to study forestry, a diploma in forestry, and that changed her career path. And she ended up uh, becoming one of Africa's only dead chronologists. You know, that is the science of dating trees from wanting to become a doctor, failure, also in quotes, and then a career change. For Alsacia Atanasio, a um, Mozambican scientist, her journey to becoming a scientist, a bright young girl doing really well in school, and then one day her father passes away in a road accident and the family is left destitute. So where she thought she was going to drop out of school, it was a former president of Mozambique who stepped in, offered her, President Michelle, who stepped in, offered her a scholarship to, which sponsored her all the way to veterinary school. Uh, for Catherine Karembe, Ugandan, born in the in the Katwe slums of Uganda, made famous by the film, Disney film, um, at university in America, Bright found herself completely unable to continue, and her mother went around the entire village, raising money from anybody who would care to help. So. Um, so this, so it's one thing to have the talent, to have an encouraging family, but there is this, this is what we talk about when you talk about the leaky pipeline, how women drop out. And it's, um, it's not even so much the cultural aspects at this point that determine what happens to a woman who has become a scientist. It's realities, you know, financial inadequacies and other challenges. 
for Tebelo Nyokong, it was just the expectation from the family that she needed to finish school quickly, get a job, and start earning money. But she was taking her time. She still wanted to continue on the scientific path. And her family was saying, you know, but we need you to bring in money. You need you to, we need you to help your siblings. So she compromised. She would work for her father's brick building company during the day and then go to school at night. And um, so that, that uh, kind of compromises that women have to make. And I'm sure young men also have to make it. Now, but are, not all of them are negative. Not all of these disruptions are uh, negative. For Zara uh, from Madagascar, who wanted to become an, an energy physicist, it was actually a very positive thing that I guess we can say uh, diverted her path. Uh, the launch of the Square Kilometer Array, which is hosted in South Africa, offered her a scholarship. And where she thought she was going to be to study energy, physics energy, she ended up becoming an astronomer. And she's not regretted that uh, diversion to date. So, um, and then it's what happened in the early career days. For Habiba, uh, um, the, uh, uh, who studies um, consanguinity in uh, Tunisia, it was her idea to bring in genomics research into medicine. Her first degree was medicine, but she wanted to bring in the idea of researching genomes so that to understand the, the very, very serious problem of, of consanguinity related um, uh, disabilities in, in North Africa and the Arab world. And this ruffled a lot of feathers, male colleagues, and so on. But um, she, she still went ahead and she pushed and she followed that as a career path and made a lot of difference. For Falasade Agunshala, um, her career was taking off in the early 1990s during the military dictatorship in Nigeria. And what she told me was for, for a long time, she was just not able to do any research because of the freeze in uh, funding, international funding. And it, it, this, this, she tells me, was a time of darkness. She just saw darkness. She looked ahead, she says, she saw nothing but darkness. Um, but eventually, you know, um, she, she somehow managed to keep things going, borrowing equipment, repairing broken equipment from other colleagues to keep a level of uh, research going. And then, um, so uh, to earn legitimacy within the international scientific communities, I think there are two ways that scientists can do that. It is either through, it is by contributing through the Global Knowledge Hub and by contributing to Africa. And I think the women that we spoke to, they showed that this is something, this is, an, this is a balance that African women scientists are able to make. For example, uh, Judith from Benin, who is studying, who is studying, who is an immunologist, uh, she just made breakthrough uh, findings and generated knowledge on B cells. Um, Tabella Nyokong, who is studying, who who's made breakthroughs on photo phototherapy using laser and nanotechnology. Um, Aminata from Senegal who is leading the fight against hepatitis, and Jihan, who is working on biomedicine and bioecology. So there is a lot of knowledge that is coming out from African women scientists that is very comparable and that is augmenting the Global Knowledge Hub. But at the same time, from at least the, the, uh, the women that we spoke to, even somebody like Maryam Chedid, the first astronomer to ever set up a an observatory in the Antarctica, or Evrine Bende, who is working on the helium potential in Tanzania. It's it's a, the, that delicate balance that they are maintaining in terms of being globally recognized scientists, in terms of claiming their place within the international scientific community, um, gaining that legitimacy, but also contributing to very, very specific um, problems in Africa. Judith's um, 
immunology research, I have said, has, it was internationally break, breaking. It, it was a breakthrough, global breakthrough on the B cells. Uh, but it also, she's also been able to do very Africa-specific research on um, malaria, on the on the malaria parasite and co-infections in children. And that is really, that is, has changed the way treatment of malaria in children is administered. Um, Asta Gebel Christo's work on dating, the science of dating trees is now being whittled down to help farmers to better integrate agroforestry into their, into their practices. Um, Ancesia Tanasio from Mozambique, uh, she's um, animal parasitology, that is her area, she's contributed globally, but at the same time she's led the global geographical indication um, for, for Mozambican goats called Cabrito de Tete. So, and then we've got Catherine Nakarembe, very groundbreaking uh, GIS um, science, translating it into solutions for Africa, especially for very, very arid areas. So she's been recognized for her efforts to use data science in drought management and in planning and forecasting. Um, Uduak Amimo from, from uh, Nigerian, Nigeria working in Gambia, her new NATO knowledge has changed the way, has brought a very Africa specific focus to neonatal infections and reducing neonatal deaths. Um, so so it, it's, um, and, and uh, Zara from Mozambique, she's advancing, she's studying young galaxies, which is really high edge science, but at the same time, she's coming back to Earth and advancing uh, astronomical science in Africa, especially the younger generation. So all these women that um, we, we have featured, they are institution builders. From building a lab, Faith Osiel uh, here, from building a lab, she's built um, malaria vaccine labs that are conducting research on malaria vaccine in Kenya, in Germany, in London, in the U just across, across Africa and Europe. Um, Tebelo Nyokong has built um, her laboratory in, uh, at Rose University where she's based, but also it's become a hub for scientists from across Africa to study laser science and nanotechnology. Sengenet Karemu um, is, is recognized for having turned the biosciences Eastern, Afri Eastern Central African hub called Beka Iri Hub into one of the continent's success stories. It is the, the premier hub for biosciences research in Africa, where hundreds of scientists have passed through to conduct cutting edge research on world class uh, standards. And then she has revolutionized and, and transformed the International Center of Insect Physiology and Ecology, ICIPE, the only institution in the world that specifically focuses on, uh, <clears throat> on insects. Francis from uh, the Republic of Congo, educated in the in France, uh, unable to return to her country for a long time because of civil war, but eventually came back, found all those close to her, and then uh, founded her own uh, um, foundation to conduct medical research. For Asade Ogunshara, uh, one of the few female vice chancellors um, uh, at the, currently at the University of uh, Lagos, uh, so these are women who are not only bench scientists, but women who are in leadership uh, positions. And what I think I found also interesting is their role in policy making and capacity building. Ibrin uh, Bende has been very influential in um, Tanzania and in changing the, as a director of the science uh, and technology department in the Ministry of Science and Technology in Tanzania, she changed the funding model. Um, the, the got the country closer to one, the one percent of gross G domestic product that many countries have pledged for, and changed that this money should be allocated to infrastructure as well as as, as well as research. Um, 
many of these women have won a lot of um, between them they've won hundreds and hundreds of of um, of international recognition which means that their 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 legitimacy is solidified but I, and that's including the younger generation somebody like uh, Priscilla Coribea very young uh, from Nigeria from a neuropharmacologist from Niger from uh, Ghana who is already you know in her 20s or whatever but still gaining a lot of recognition so and um, their disruption disruptive thinking for example Maria Drade from uh, Cap Verde now working in Mozambique has has made made um has been influential in mainstreaming biofortification of food and in in terms of um, this she's brought well for she's mainstream by fortification of food and especially with the breeding of uh, sweet potatoes that have helped to combat vitamin a deficiency in africa so um i'm coming i don't think i spoke to the 40 uh, for the 40 minutes that uh, theo had said but coming to the end of my presentation i thought that uh, we could move on now to a discussion and some of the thoughts that I thought we might um, just deliver it on uh, and I'm happy to answer questions as to say more to draw more examples from the books book is how may we reimagine the discourses and narratives surrounding the power agency and legitimacy of African women scientists second is the segmentation of women scientists as a social world still varied Meaning, do we still need to keep talking about women scientists or African women scientists? Should we just say scientists? Is it is there anything unique about them, or are they okay now? Should we just uh, consider everybody equal, men, women? Is there still need to segment women scientists? Um, but also, what do we think about science in Africa? Is it what the world says it is? Or is it better? Is it worse? What should be done? Uh, what, what changes do you need to be done? And about funding, uh, many of the comments that I got from uh, the women that we spoke to was about the need for more homegrown funding, that the over-reliance to, um, to internal funding is one of the threats to the legitimacy and the power of African scientists. Uh, of African scientists, whether women, whether male or female. So um, I'm trying to see there was something there here that uh, uh, needed to read to you. Um, our capacities often, this is from Faith Ossiel, uh, who is working on malaria, a Kenyan scientist working on malaria vaccines. Our capacities and outputs often pale in comparison with those of international peers, relegating us to the status of poor cousins at the table. Um, we have massive brain power in Africa and thousands of jobless young graduates. We need to provide them with resources so that they can develop in innovative solutions. So, and then she said a lack of resources also disadvantages African scientists within the global scientific community. We have the resources to fund our own science. So, um, especially for colleagues from, from Africa who are joining in, so do we need homegrown funding? Do we have enough? And then there was a question of basic research that um, the global narrative is that science in Africa should be applied, which then means that there's no, there's very little money being allocated to basic research. And also for investment intensive research like um, like malaria vaccine, which is really needed in Africa, there are no resources coming in. And then there's a question of recognition of scientists, especially women scientists. Um, it was felt that that's quite low. And then what does this book, based on what I uh, have presented and what I can, the more, the more points that I can add, what does it tell us about identifying, nurturing and retaining scientific talent? What new strategies and mechanisms do we need? Um, Thank you so much for joining in and I'm um, looking forward to more discussions. 
thank you so much, Liz, uh, for this fascinating presentation. Actually, it's um, uh, really fascinating to hear the individual stories of these women scientists uh, and the struggles which they put up um, for legitimacy um, uh, in the South, but also um, against dominant narratives uh, in, in the North. Um, let Let's go to get some questions. Um, there are some, I'm, I'm sure there are some interesting questions uh, to be asked. Um, so I've got, um, I've got the first question from Francois. Um. Oh, sorry, uh, do you hear me? Uh, yes. OK, uh, yeah, uh, I'm talking as a Nigerian, really, because, uh, you know, I, I was there for 25 years and I only moved out of my university in the uh, end of 95. I resigned at that time. I was uh, near 50. Now, the question, uh, first of all, I want to say that I strongly believe from experience that most of the women scientists and generally African scientists are totally unknown outside. When I came back and I was talking with my French colleagues uh, in research, they were just talking as if Nigeria is uh, like people are living in trees and they don't know anything. It was absolutely awful. And uh, they didn't know that people were doing research there. And uh, also there was a total, um, you know, condescending regard to whatever would be published there. And I think that's, so the, the reason why they are not known is because when they publish within the African continent or even within their own country, now my own experience is Nigeria, that first of all, even their universities there treat their own national publications as second best. They have that kind of mentality that they believe that unless you are published outside in America or somewhere in Europe or, you know, then that is the real thing. And that is uh, something that we should fight against. Uh, thirdly, if they cannot, because it's very difficult to publish outside and it's getting worse because now, for example, in America, you have to pay, not even to, to be published, you have to pay for your, uh, your article to be assessed. And the people at home in Nigeria don't have that kind of money. So it, they are barred from publishing from the start and it's even worse in science unless you have a lab that is ready to sponsor you. So that's another thing. Also, I find that that many people, like somebody recently told me like three weeks ago, oh, in Nigeria, there are only, there are three types of people. There are two, two types of people, those that have traveled out and those that want to travel. And so there is that feeling that you can never start publishing unless uh, and succeed in your profession, like uh, as a researcher. Uh, unless you travel out and you resettle somewhere else. But when they do, they find out that everything is not what they have been told and very few succeed. Another thing that I found, somebody contacted me recently from uh, Northern Cameroon. Uh, he is a PhD student. He was saying, oh, I feel like dropping my PhD uh, because, and I said, why? Uh, he said, well, that uh, is very difficult. He doesn't get support. And I started giving him my own example when I was in Nigeria doing my PhD without support and that I succeeded. And he, I said I didn't have research money because people were taking the little research money to build house in the village instead. And uh, so it was, uh, you know, I didn't want to go into that. So I just did it at home, you know, at night and struggled and did it. And uh, he didn't want to listen to that. So there are lots of you know, like what you mentioned about girls that uh, are supposed to marry, or oh, that is still somehow the case. And uh, if they, there is money for only one, they will prefer the boys. But I think that gradually this thing is changing because I know somebody now that we trained and now he's a medical doctor and he trained, he had uh, three girls and the girls are doing mechanical engineering and other stuff like that. They are not into, uh, uh -huh. And I think also we have to tell the people at home that is in Africa that the solution is not to get out, 
because even even if you succeed outside it will be america or the uk or whoever that will say hey, hey, my own people did it and africa will not be recognized so i feel that there are lots of sad elements in that and i want I, i'm really impressed by your book i'm going to buy it and uh, and give it to my family so thank you very much thanks very much uh, liz um any response to that uh, you're muted. Yeah, so thank you so much, Francois. I think you've raised a, a number of uh, points. First of all, is the legitimacy within the international scientific community, which is in many cases measured by how and where you're publishing. And um, I think this is this is a struggle for African scientists. I don't know how uniquely it affects African women scientists, but I know for a lot of African scientists, this continues to be the case. Uh, so I think this is a question I would want to open up to the audience just to hear what their own thoughts are about uh, what can be done about this dis disenfranchisement that, um, that African scientists go through. So it's what is called the Matthew effect, the richer get richer and the poorer get poorer. So the people who are publishing more get their research grants and then they publish even more while the people who are not, you know, it just becomes an entire circle. Then there are all these narratives about Africa, which is something that we found in our book. Um, I think we've all, we've all had them, especially those of us who've studied or lived abroad about their reason. In Africa, their reason. In Africa, their reason. But I do not want to romanticize the story about Africa, but the statistics, especially when it comes to the uh, kind of knowledge, to the level of knowledge being produced in the continent, we need to come up with better indicators and a better assessment to really find out the truth, because there is a lot of science that is happening. Maybe it's not enough, but there is a lot of knowledge being produced in this continent, but it's probably not legitimized or mainstreamed or acknowledged. So, and then um, there was a thing of uh, exemplars, you know, these people who want to leave because they think it will be easy on the other side. So I think that, um, like this book, one of the goals or objectives that we see for it is that it will present examples. It will show that it is possible, for example, like I said, the case of Falasade during the Nigerian military rule, the struggle that she went through um, and just seeing darkness ahead and then deciding, no, 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 I'm going to still be a scientist. I will borrow a broken uh, water bath somewhere and fix it and keep my career going until things get better. But also there are people who have gone abroad and are doing really well. We spoke to uh, a young lady from Niger, uh, Faji Maina, who is at NASA. She is working on a water atlas using supercomputers it is not to do with Africa, her science is not to do with Africa, but still she considers herself a daughter of the Sahel and whatever knowledge she can bring back home, she is bringing it back. So there is nothing specifically wrong about moving out of the continent if you feel that, um, that, that, that you get better opportunities there, but to remember where you come from. I think that is the idea and serve your continent, have pride in your continent still and contribute to scientific knowledge that can transform it. That is one of the, the that is what I would say, we, the women in the book uh, seemed to be saying, especially those who are living and working abroad. Faith Ociel, the Kenyan um, that I mentioned, is now a professor at Imperial College London, but still working on the malaria vaccine, which she says, I know there are many women and children in Africa waiting for this vaccine. That is what keeps me going. That, those are her own words. So I think that would be my response, but it would be interesting to also hear um, what the audience has to say, and especially in terms of how we theorize moving forward. What theoretical concept can we form about these challenges and these narratives about Africa and about African women that continue to, uh, to, to, to persist. Thank you, Liz. Um, next, I've got uh, Dave Wild. Dave? Hi, Liz. 
Lovely to see you. Um, very nice to see you. Um, excellent book. Uh, and I have to admit, I felt terribly ignorant listening to you because I, to be honest, I had no idea how many really superb world, world class women scientists uh, there are, which is great news, I must say. So I've got two quick questions. I'm not sure how theoretical they are, really. One, one is, um, uh, do, do these women scientists organize themselves in order to, to build a profile for more women scientists uh, from Africa and in Africa? So, so is there an organization that, that they're involved in to improve visibility? That's one question. And then my second question, it was really around women, whether a scientists are, are scientists or whether there's a category women scientists. And it I mean, my, my thought, but I'd like to know what you think about it, was that actually if, if African women scientists, as African women scientists are organizing and, and developing new ideas and institutions, surely that is good. That has to be good, doesn't it, for everyone, um, for all humanity. Uh, and so they're, in a way, they're doing a job which should be being done by everyone, but they at least are doing a job. So that that's what was my take on the on the women scientist um, versus versus scientist. So yeah. Plus maybe oh, we can find out how to get hold of third very quickly. It would be great if someone could tell us how to get hold of your book. That would be brilliant. Thank you. Okay, all right. Oh, Dave, such a joy to see you. And um, I think I need to really say here that Dave was my PhD Viva examiner. He was my my internal examiner and he was just uh, unbelievably kind and um, professional with me. I'm so grateful, Dave. So in terms of your questions, um, I think you're not the only one who is ignorant. Even us, as we were writing this book, we went into it very, very ignorant. We thought, oh, let's, uh, let's aim for about 10 women. We'll be lucky if we get them. And then we ended up with a list of 100 of fantastic, outstanding women. So it was really, really um, a, a very present surprise that there are this many women and we had to leave out, I guess, um, three quarters of them. We couldn't, we couldn't feature them. And those were just the ones that we quickly put together. So there are many, many, many more. So um, one of, uh, in terms of uh, do women, have women uh, scientists in Africa organized themselves? Um, Yes and no. They are, I think the reason why Africa is ahead, in slightly ahead in terms of the percentage of scientists who are women is because a lot of effort since the turn of the new millennium, a lot of effort has been made in Africa to promote science and technology in general. That is from uh, the African Union, as high as the African Union, there's been a lot of policies and so on. And um, based on that, there are very, there are quite a number of uh, initiatives that are supporting African women scientists. But uh, beyond that grant making and um, grant making role or uh, mentoring, some of them are doing mentoring, there is not a proper association or organization of women. Uh, that's something that we quickly realized that you have to pick from here, pick from there, get the information from there, but there is no one hub they, and they don't even know each other. So um, the challenge when we launched this book, the challenge that the women featured in this book uh, through at us as the author and the publisher was that can we at least start with these 20, 20 something women uh, form a network and then build on it. So there is need for that. And I'm hoping that the next phase of this book will be coming up with such a platform that would then become a, a hub where if you want to find out a woman scientist in Africa working on nanotechnology, you can quickly go there or if you need mentorship or whatever. So that is the next phase of this book. Uh, so then in terms of African women versus scientists, I think personally, I tend to agree with you, Dave. There are dissenting voices that say that this is a no debate. We've dealt with this women issue and now we are disenfranchising the boy child. There, there is all that. But I think there's still 
um, a reason to focus on African on women scientists in general because they go through un very unique processes. But while doing that, let us also not lose sight of the complexities within which we as human beings live. Women scientists still live within the same complexities as their male count counterparts. And if there is a way we can approach the gender issue in a more balanced way so that men and women are able to uh, realize their, their ideological uh, goals as scientists, uh, then that I think would be the best way to move forward. Thank you, Liz. Um, I don't see any other question. Oh, there is a question. Uh, Clem. Hello, um, Liz. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Clem Herman. I'm uh, a professor in the STEM faculty in at the Open University and uh, just really delighted to hear your talk. Um, I've done a lot of research myself on women in STEM careers, um, not specifically in Africa, but in uh, many other countries. Um, and it was absolutely um, it was wonderful to see the examples that you showed in your book and the research that you've done, um, because these stories really need to be told and really these different career paths that individuals have taken um, because we we do um, we have these kind of stereotypes about how a scientific career should be conducted and somehow if you miss the very first uh, you know you fail your school exams that's it you can't get through to the next hurdle and also if you specialize in one thing then uh, that's your choice for life whereas in fact the real stories and particularly amongst women is that the the scientific and technical careers can be um, can move in different directions start in different places and so on so it was really interesting some of the stories you told um, uh, my question was really about how how this resource could be used or whether there's some uh, possible um, way in which or any plans for using it. Um, one of the things we know is the sort of power of role models, especially for uh, school girls who are making choices about their subjects and whether there's any uh, way in which this resource could be made available, particularly um, in African high schools and, and that sort of thing to encourage uh, and give really um, um, set aspirations amongst um, girls to make these kind of choices. Uh, thank you so much, Clem, and uh, I certainly would want to know more about your, your work. Yes, um, it's uh, it's very interesting how these uh, scientific what we saw from the book is just how interesting our how quickly our assumptions about how a scientific career should proceed how quickly that fell apart because we saw women who were like I said who were inspired into science by something like a picture they saw of a woman scientist graduating. Or you know, or like you said, you know, failure in one, it didn't go one path, but then you know something else opened up. So um, you're very right that this book we need to make it more available, especially to you, to not just to young to young girls, yes, but I think it's also very useful to any young person or any person who is on a journey because it it shows you that. You know the t twist and turns. They come with good things, and and then, and it also shows that you the excitement of uh, of science because we've gone into the detail of how of the scientific achievement, how they've been achieved, and then how they impact on development. So I think that is really a challenge that we need to take on to make it more available to to young people. Um, in high school or at university level. So yes, thank you very much for that suggestion. And I think just to say, you know, I have a couple of 
projects. We've actually been working on a project um, at the Open University, which is developing materials for science, science materials for high school online uh, um, experiments and so on, uh, working in partnership, particularly in Ghana. Uh, and I definitely will um, pass on the link to this resource because I think it will be fantastic if they can include this as part of the kind of resources for the teachers um, okay. because the I think the teachers have a big part to play as well in highlighting the success stories as well. So yeah. thank you very much, Liz. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, thanks very much. Um, do we have any other question? Uh, I think I did see one hand up then went away, but I couldn't catch who was that. Um, OK, I don't see any other question. I mean, I, 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 I do have uh, uh, a few thoughts uh, on this uh, excellent work. And um, uh, one thought uh, I made when I was listening to Liz was um, this book that was published back in 2018 by uh, Boaventura de Sousa Santos. Um, and the title of the book was The End of the Cognitive Empire in which he argued basically that uh, if we want to make progress with decolonization of, of knowledge, um, we have to recognize the importance of the um, ecologies of knowledge of the South, uh, not only because of their scientific rigor, but more importantly, because they emerge through struggles, through struggles against uh, domination, exclusion, uh, discrimination and repression. So the fascinating stories of those uh, individual women scientists that you presented to us actually confirm this kind of struggles taking place, which are not uh, struggles necessarily uh, only um, about, um, you know, um, the cognitive empire from the north, but also struggles uh, within the boundaries and the limitations of, 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 of the South um, to gain legitimacy. So this legitimacy um, doesn't come uh, easily. It comes through uh, struggles against different fronts. And I think that's probably one uh, conceptual framework for theoriz theorization of this uh, work, which, which is great actually, because you can um, extend that to other contexts as well. Oh yeah, most certainly. I'm, I'm really um, a great, uh, well, I want to imagine that uh, I'm a follower of the decolonization, decolonizing knowledge um, movement. And exactly what you're saying is what myself and my dear friend, Dr. Seganet Kalem, who is she featured in this book, that is what we keep arguing, that a fair and justice just world, you know, we are not going to to reimagine our future properly without the participation of everybody and without acknowledging and accepting all ways of knowing and all knowledge being produced. So um, I think for you, I, I would want to to follow up this conversation with you and especially about uh, the book, just to see how we could move this forward and uh, package it more in a more theoretical concept framework. Uh, around the decolonization of knowledge. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks very much. Um, do we have any other question from from the audience? I'm aware of the time. It's already uh, one thirty. So if if there is any other question, uh, please uh, go ahead and ask. Yeah. Hi. Uh, it's Lorena. Nice to meet oh, you. Hi, Liz. Lorena. Uh, yeah, yeah, I have actually a follow up question on this um, decolonizing uh, knowledge and uh, diversifying voices uh, in, uh, you know, also interdisciplinary way. So, yeah, I wanted to just like ask if you could uh, give us from, I mean, some insights or uh, recommendation for us, uh, a university who's tried to be open. Uh, but I mean, sometimes the impression is that we are just doing, as many others, just cosmetic fixes instead of uh, creating the condition for a transformative, uh, you know, solutions. Um, 
So, I mean, in a, what, just to give you an example, uh, one way of doing, I guess, are, uh, you know, like um, uh, setting up scholarships who are focusing on uh, and directing to, uh, you know, like students from the global south or from marginal backgrounds. Uh, at the same time, we don't want to create a brain drain of the best, <laughs> you know, to 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 create then center of excellence in the global, uh, re reproduce center of excellence in the global north, and like the, the and like you know without like having uh, allow me the trickle down to the global south. So I was wondering whether you could expand a little bit uh, that and what is your opinion on this? Thank you. Thank you so much, Lorena, and uh, good to meet you as well. I, yeah, I think um, for the Open University has been very generous, especially to scholars like myself from Africa. Um, I think I felt very welcome and I felt that I had the freedom to explore whatever I wanted to, to research. Now, what I think is the issue is not even so much the brain drain, it is that um, I don't know, I don't want to get political here, but uh, we did not have the chance because of the regulations to then stay on at least for a while to as a, in a postdoctoral capacity to then form proper research uh, thrust that we could then come back home and continue collaborating with the researchers at the Open University. So I think for me, it's forming networks with your alumni. That would be one way. Forming networks of research or or just networks of, um, you know, just discussions and discourse. Maybe a, a, a regular conference where you bring back all your alumni or even if it's virtually or whatever, but to tap into this resource that is trained at the Open University that leaves and never never looks back, basically. So I'm actually very grateful that I've come back home today and that I've, I've renewed my connections with the Open University because it's one way of then us feeding back uh, into what you're doing and strengthening what is already a very good uh, mission and vision. Yeah, thank you. Actually, can I just follow up, Tio? We are like doing uh, since a couple of years, like uh, a PhD hub, actually, which is like uh, a PhD Fogo series of seminars for PhD to present. And I think it's uh, you give me <laughs> an interesting idea that maybe we could invite also uh, former PhD students to present uh, uh, obviously, now you, you've you already been a <laughs> good speaker for our standard seminars. Yeah, thanks very much for your insights. That's excellent. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Lorena. Um, uh, is there any other um, question? Perhaps um, the last question. No, I, I don't see. Um, I don't see anyone from the audience wanted to ask another question. Um, so um, that was a fascinating seminar. I would like to thank you again, uh, Liz, for for the presentation. I, I forgot to say that Liz was joining us today from Kenya, from from Nairobi. So uh, thanks so much for for your time, uh, for coming to present to us. Uh, and thanks so much um, to everyone for their questions. Now, this was the first uh, seminar uh, of international development and, and um, innovation for, for this year. There are uh, more interesting, uh, important seminars coming up as well. Uh, so please watch this space uh, for the next uh, seminar series. And um, thank you all again for attending. Thank you.